Pretty much the entire year of me working on Hodag has been riddled with problems. Hey Builders, it's Tyler of Team Cryptid Robotics and today I'm giving the complete rundown of the build of my three pound punch spinner Hodag. I've been working on it about a year now and it's been to six events already so I've already done six videos on it. So if you've seen all six of those videos, a lot of this is gonna be a review. But since I'm going to NHRL at the beginning of June, I figured there'd be a few new people that might find out about Hodag and I didn't want them to have to watch six videos in order to get caught up on at least how Hodag works. If you want to know how Hodag did at previous events, you'll still have to watch those videos. So they're still worth watching and it does, this doesn't completely negate that. Unsurprisingly, Hodag was inspired by the BattleBot Tantrum, which is pretty much, as far as I know, the OG quote unquote punch spinner. The punch spinner referring to the spinner that is has a linear articulation in order to sort of get more bite on the opponent while also being able to control when you actually engage with your spinner. I saw Tantrum win the giant nut a few years back and thought that maybe more people should be trying out the, this whole punch spinner weapon. And while working on Hodag, I learned why people don't do that because it's actually very hard to aid I get it to actually punch and then get it to continue punching without the whole weapon assembly exploding and also not have it cost an arm and a leg. While I definitely got the idea of a punch spinner from Tantrum, it is definitely not meant to be my own three pound replica of Tantrum. It is definitely meant to be my interpretation of how I think a punch spinner should be, or at least a three pound punch spinner should be. In order to give the best understanding of how the NHRL ready version of Hodag works, I'm gonna talk about Hodag piece by piece and then talk about any changes made to that part of the robot in terms of that part of the robot as opposed to going through it in like chronological order and version history since I've already made six videos that are were structured that way. We'll start out by talking about the chassis of the robot that way you understand what everything's attached to. The main body consists of top plates, bottom plates, and rear sides and front. The rear sides and front are all 3D printed TPU. The reason that the rear doesn't actually come into direct contact with the front or sides but the front and sides are separate because it's just easier to work on different parts of Hodag that way. It would have been a lot harder to do maintenance if it was all one part. The base plate of Hodag is 8th inch 6061 aluminum. I tried 7075 but found that when it got damaged it would get bent and there'd be no way for me to bend it back into shape. So at least the 6061, while theoretically more likely to bend, I can actually bend it back into shape if it that happens. And the base plate also has countersunk holes that way the M4, the countersunk M4 plastite screws aren't sticking out at all and I can have the robot lower. The top plates, it has two top plates with how the robot ends up getting split with the punching mechanism. So I have two carbon fiber top plates. I also have a alternate titanium top plates for top attacks. I didn't have the time to make something more complicated for top attacks without, you know, affecting how the robot drives upside down. Next, we'll get into the most exciting part, Hodag's weapon. The easiest way to do a punch spinner, I found, was just to have a hub motor for the spinner. So I used the Repeat Robotics 2207 hub motor and a 2.5 inch diameter and 3 8 inch thick AR500 blade. That 2 8 half inch diameter blade is tiny for a beetle, so I occasionally have troubles actually getting a bite on my opponent, but that Hub motors attached to two billeted UHMW sides. Originally it was 3D printed polycarbonate because that was a lot cheaper, but I found that that would just get destroyed in practically every fight. Big sparks as they go weapon to weapon. Oh, push you skipping into the wall. And the UHMW has been a lot more durable, although it is a lot more expensive since it needs complex geometry in order for it to slide on linear rails. And the linear rails are just three sixteenths diameter steel rods. Originally it was one eighth diameter, but that ended up getting bent too easily. I tried tungsten carbide rods because that wouldn't bend at all. The problem is it would still shatter 
and I decided that having bent rods is better than shattered rods because I don't want that weapon freely floating because I don't want it to fall inside the robot and suck up my own electronics. Plus it looks more broken if it shatters and if it's dangling, that's a lot worse for the judges to look at than it just being like kind of bent in and I just can't actuate the linear mechanism. With that said, the linear mechanism is driven by a servo and a timing belt. The timing belt is fixed both pretty much at the servo. So I had to like 3D print a quote unquote pulley, but it's not really a pulley because it's fixed at two ends and it's fixed at the weapon itself. It basically, the servo turns and it moves the weapon back and forth. The servo I use is just one that was recommended to me that could run off a 3S battery without burning up. I do find that using the servo with the timing belt, the timing belt likes to break some a lot of the time and the servo can be kind of slow. I almost forgot to mention that the spinner and the servo for the weapon operate off of their own 3S battery. And while we're on the subject, I'm just going to go over the electronics and then get into the drive. The two separate batteries ha each have their own finger tech switch and I used a ER4 Express LRS receiver. The drive itself has its own 4S battery and uses the Repeat Robotics Dual Brushless ESC going to two Repeat Robotics Compact Brushless Motors. I went with brushless because I wanted the drive to be basically be as compact as possible and that's the best way to get the most energy with the least amount of weight because I'd have the extra weight for that servo. Those motors are mounted directly to the back of the robot and go to two large wheels in the back. The wheels are as big as they are that way they can extend out the back and the top of the robot so that way I'm able to get out of weird situations a lot easier as, and Hodag can self right as long as those big wheels are touching the ground and those big rear wheels have timing belts that go to smaller wheels in the front. They're inside the robot and mounted to the sides of the robot. A lot of people end up thinking that Hodag is two wheel drive because they can't see the front wheels. And all four wheels are custom molded with using Vitaflex 40. I tried using Vitaflex 30 because that's what I used on my ants but found that it was entirely too soft and wore away too quickly for a beetle. Lastly, I'll talk about the front of the robot since I put enough design into it that I think it deserves its own section. While I started with a relatively simple wedge and some with some forks coming out of it, I ended up going with a more modular option in the end. That way I can switch out fork configurations pretty quickly. For going against horizontals, I have this wedge that fills up all the slots and it's just a big TPU trapezoid that so far has worked pretty well. but. I definitely know that there's some bigger and scarier horizontal spinners that I've yet to fight, so we'll see if it can hold up against them. As far as forks go, I do have metal forks for it, but I haven't really used them very much. I mostly rely on these big fat forks that end up taking up two of the slots. I also have little wedgelets that can go in between like the more standard of forks, as well as these little TPU forks that are shorter and have sort of a wedge on the side that are kind of meant to make it a little bit easier to get underneath people at more of the angles or the corners of the front of Hodag. Ultimately, I'm pretty satisfied with the forks I have now because against most matchups, I often have the advantage when it comes to the ground game at a lot more angles than my opponent does while also being able to sort of mix and match I should also mention that I added the little trapezoidal blockers that you see on the top after the first event when I went against a drum spitter and he rolled over the top of the robot and completely obliterated the weapon. Pretty much the entire year of me working on Hodag has been riddled with problems. It was meant to go to an event a month before its first event, but my parts didn't arrive and honestly even if they did arrive on time when I was hoping they would. It wouldn't have all fit together and been ready in that amount of time. Go, it, the punching mechanism didn't really work at all going into the first event. And then, so it didn't really get to compete for like several months until the start of 2025. And at the start of 2025, it was able to punch now, but then the punching mechanism or the weapon assembly would just come detached from the robot. And pretty much every single fight, or at least every fight at one event that I went to, and then once I switched to the UHMW weapon assembly and it was no longer exploding every, every fight, Hodag would turn off for no reason in every fight. And then once I got that to stop happening, I was finally able to go second. In spite of that, at all six events, it's gone two and two. Admittedly, not all of those events felt like not all of those two and two records felt quite the same, but in spite of all the changes, it did as well at the first event by record as it did at the last event, if you ignore like what place it got. 
since I knew for the entire time I was working on Hodag that I was going to take it to NHRL with the rest of the MRCA builders in June, I wanted it to be essentially dialed in by that event. And so the entire de developmental cycle and design cycle has been around getting it at its peak in June. It is pretty much in a stable state. I'm not going into NHRL with anything experimental other than a configuration for going against flamethrowers. Naturally, the last part of Hodag's development before NHRL was I had to take it up to Rhinelander. For those that don't know, Rhinelander is home with Hodag, and I'm pretty sure that the reason I've gone two and two at every single event with Hodag is because I am cursed after deciding to name my robot after the Hodag, despite never having gone to Rhinelander. So hopefully this trip will lift the curse and I can finally do better once I get to NHRL. After NHRL, my plan for Hodag is to focus on qualifying for the MRCA finals. At the time of recording, he's sitting at rank 32, but by the time you guys are watching this, he's probably fallen out of the top 32. I also have an idea for a version 3 that should be able to make Hodag's weapon a lot more effective. More on that when I actually come up with it and create it. <laughs> if you want more Hodag stuff to watch, be sure to watch this video on screen now. This is the first, this is the first Hodag build video I made, so you can see how far we came.